Hey there. Before we start this episode, I wanted to jump into your ears straight away and let you know how you can support us best with this podcast so we can keep this going. So the most important thing that when you have listened to this episode would be share, 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 spread the word, drop our name, drop us in the conversation. If you see a question popping up somewhere, say the damn parenting ladies, they have an episode on this, pop the episodes out, get us into the conversation of the communities. This is the best way to support Eva and me. And give us a like on Spotify, give us a follow, jump over to Instagram, damn parenting podcast, Make sure that you spread the word about what you like, why you like the episodes, and that you spread the knowledge that we are putting out there so it can be heard and received by everyone who needs to hear this. And this is what I just wanted to drop with you before now you can enjoy the pet or an expert episode. So let's see what's going to be on. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Damn Parenting your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. As always, we are your hosts, Eva and Marvin. And today we are delighted to welcome back for the third time, Eowyn Crisfield. Hi, Eowyn. Hello. Nice to be back. (laughs) Wonderful to have you back. Eowyn is from On Raising Bilingual Children on Instagram. Um, She is a depth of knowledge that I think probably 99% of the families listening here are probably very much attuned into because she is here to help us discuss languages within our families. And as we are international families, we're living in the Netherlands, which has the Dutch language, as we all know very well, trying to manage that expectation. And for today's episode, one of the things we actually wanted to bring up was the introduction of a language later on in life. And this has come to myself and Marin in two different ways, funnily enough. Uh, Marin had one story and I was kind of like, oh, I heard something similar. So one of the stories I heard was uh, someone was moved to the Netherlands for their job. They actually spoke Dutch so well, it just became their natural language to speak in. They fell in love, got married, had children. And then it was only later on when you're like, where are you from? And you realize you actually are raising your children in the Dutch language fully, and they've actually missed out on their actual native language. So it was that kind of draw that you're thinking, wow, yeah, some people really are missing that aspect. Language actually has such an important part because it's part of people's culture. It's uh, very important to meet our families and our distant relatives. And so it's one of those topics we kind of thought AO might be able to help us in as equally you might in the future if you divorce separate or you meet someone they might have a different language and that can also be quite interesting for your children maybe as well to be open to to find out more about another culture as well so anyone how do we manage this if we haven't actually had our child from birth speaking all these and hearing all these different languages how is it that we would be able to bring this smoothly into our families so the the first thing that I want to say is that if you made a decision at some point in your parenting to not use a particular language or if it helped by if it happened by accident and you didn't actually decide, don't feel bad. It happens. There's a lot going on when we're parenting that is of more pressing interest to us than what language we're speaking. And so sometimes people with very young babies, especially, they just go with whatever's easiest, go with whatever people are telling them to do. And that seems right at the time. And then they turn around, you know, five years later or seven years later or 10 years later and say, oh, actually, I really wish I had. And if that happened to you, don't beat yourself up because multilingualism is a part of who we are as a parent, but we've got lots of other competing priorities as well. That said, if it has happened to you or if it does happen to you and you really actually feel that this is now something I want to address with my family, with my child, with myself, this lack of a language. There are loads of ways to do it. How you approach it will depend in large part on the age of your child at the time, on their disposition for languages, if they like languages or don't, and on your community, how big your community of practice is. So what I mean by that is if you were to imagine, say you came to the Netherlands and, I don't know, Brazilian Portuguese was your first language and you lived there for 10 years and you became a fluent speaker of Dutch and you hardly ever had the opportunity to use Brazilian Portuguese. And then you had a baby and your partner was Dutch and so you did Dutch, 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 Dutch. And then when they're four years old, you realize oh, they can't speak to my sisters, my brothers, their extended family. What do I do? Big piece of what you can do depends on who's around you, how big you build your community. Because the reason that parent hasn't continued using Brazilian Portuguese is because they don't have a community. For whatever reason, when they've arrived in the Netherlands, they've not had the the time, the ability, whatever, 
to build their own community network of Brazilian Portuguese speakers. And so it didn't serve a purpose for them anymore. So they just got out of the habit of using it. And so if we want to introduce a language to our children later, we have to find a community in which to situate that practice. It's usually not very effective to say to a child, well, I randomly, your mother would like you to start using this language with me. And they say, well, but why? You speak Dutch. I speak Dutch. I don't speak Portuguese. You don't speak it very well. Why would I want to do that? That can feel inefficient, ineffective useless, not particularly motivating for the child if there's no real sense of why this is important. And so the, the size and the strength of your community will really help you. The second piece is to do with the age of your child. If you want to change your mind with a two-year-old, that's very difficult, different than changing your mind with an eight-year-old or with a 12-year-old. Uh, the older your child is, the more they become a partner in your family language plan. And so if you as a parent want to start using your what was your first language or your home language with your child, who's now six, well, your child has some things to say about that too, I'm sure. And so after about the age of even two, two and a half, three years old, a lot of it goes down to the conversations you have with your child. And you can frame it in different ways. Obviously, how you frame it for a two and a half year old is very different from how you frame it for a, for a six year old or a 12 year old. But it starts with acknowledging your own identity. Um, and that's something that often parents haven't done with their children. They haven't acknowledged to their child they have an identity other than Dutch. They haven't really kind of dug in with them about that side. And that's often where it comes out is they realize but a whole part of who I am now is connected to this language that my child doesn't have. And that doesn't feel good for parents. And so you have to, you know, in a way, I don't mean this in a bad way, kind of humble yourself to your children and admit you've made some mistakes, um, which all parents love to do. <laughs> and really just say, you know, mommy or daddy has another language that I grew up speaking. And when you were little, I didn't think to use it with you because everybody used Dutch. But it, I've realized it's really important to me that you speak my language and that you can go back to that country and explore that culture. What do you think we could do together to help you start learning that language? It's, it's the starting point of that conversation that you have with your child about what will make it interesting and motivating and feel interesting and pressing to them as well. So you mentioned earlier that there is children who are more drawn towards learning language and they find it easier. And then there's children who have a little bit of a struggle with that. Is there any ways and tips and tricks that you can let us know when we do have a child who we notice is a little hesitant in picking up that language or has a little bit of resistance towards it? How can we make it more tasteful to them? And what are the, the ways to go about this when we experience resistance? And I guess this is also especially when in past episodes, we had talked about languages that are considered putting this in air quotations worthier than others or more better than others. And then when we have dealing with older children, when we want to introduce languages that are from society, not viewed as something valuable, and then they get, we get backlash from a child who is maybe eight or 10 or something when they say, oh, at school, they say this, or this is like the identity of this language. I don't want to have anything to do with this. How can we deal with uh, resistance like that? So I think, you know, resistance kind of um, shows up in different ways at different ages, mm. but definitely there's a wide variety of normal in child's second language acquisition. We know some children love languages and are quite good at them, and we know other children, it's just not their thing, just like adults. Um, and so if you do have a child who is on the reluctant end of things, I think the most important thing is don't problematize it. Don't mm -hmm. turn it into a big deal. Don't push them. Don't make it a power struggle. Don't ever say to your child, I don't understand you unless you speak my language. You know, any anything where we kind of set it up as a as a power struggle, we're, we're likely to lose. And then it kind of in in connection with that is think really carefully about what what does my child love? What mm -hmm. would be useful for them to be able to do in this language? And how can I bring those things together? So if you have a child who particularly loves board games, you buy board games and you set it up that we're going to play these board games in this language because you're going to go back and you're going to play them with granny and grandpa or oma and opa or what, you know, whatever. So you really have to go to their interests and you have to be collaborative. You cannot impose a language on children. If you try, you will lose and it will be painful for everybody. In fact, I was doing a parent um, session yesterday and, and somebody said they knew somebody who just refused to listen if their child spoke the other language. And the, that parent says it, they think it worked. So I was like, well, it might have worked for your language plan, but how did it work for your parenting? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, um, because there's enough in parenting that is kind of fraught. We don't need to be introducing that into, into our family language plan as well at all. And so it's really the conversations with your child about why you think it's important for them to have this language, what they can get out of it. You know, we mentioned, I think in an earlier podcast, if you think your child should go to university in Germany because it's free, well, then you have to have that be part of your conversation. And then beyond that, just really digging into what your child will find interesting and valuable, not what you as a parent will find interesting and valuable. So if your child doesn't enjoy doing dictations and spelling tests, then that's not what you do. You just focus on oral language and storytelling and game playing. If you get them on board and if they're interested and they develop the language, the rest of it can come later. It doesn't have to come at the beginning. So I think that's really the most important and also just be patient. Can I ask you, how often should we be changing our family language plan? Oh, there, I mean, there is no right answer to that. You change your family language plan when there's a reason to change it. So if you move, you're going to have to change it. If you have another child, you might have to change it. If you make a different choice for school language, you might have to change it. Anytime you pay attention to your children's language development and think, hmm, I think maybe things are not where they need to be, that's a reason to change it. So, you know, it can be as frequently as you need, but ideally is only really when you need to. You shouldn't be, you know, changing it because someone said it might be fun, fun to do Spanish. Um, but you change it when it's not working for you. And what not working is means can vary across emotional, societal, educational, family dynamics, all kinds of different things. Because it reminds me of something you did say prior, we were talking and you had mentioned like, your child might move into English. Like when they go to school, they'll be really infused in Dutch, but they might move into English because maybe TikTok's around still then and TikTok might be the English language then. And so you were mentioning that. I did find a couple of studies um, by Annick de Hauer uh, from the director of Hermenius Bilingualism Network and professor of immersion of language acquisition and multilingualism of the University of Erfurt in Germany. That is a long phrase. So she's been doing quite a lot of uh, studies of languages. And one of the things I did find interesting was was that across different countries and languages, they found that between 12 and 44% of children who grow up here in two or more languages actually end up speaking only one. And yeah. what you're saying now is making me realize it's not down to, okay, these are our languages, this is what we're teaching. But it really always just comes back to the fold of it's actually about parenting and it's finding that connection and it's through the language of connection that you're going to develop these languages. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing that I think, you know, Nick's work highlights and, and other researchers as well, that is something we don't understand well enough is how long it takes to really develop a language fully. And so, you know, just using a language with your child from the age of birth until four and then going to school in another language and kind of, you know, using it from time to time, it's not enough. So um, Fred Genesee, who does his research in Canada, does a lot of work around bilingual and trilingual children. He said to me once in conversation that you need consistent and high quality input over a long period of time. Those are the three things you need. So consistent, regular, high quality, not just what's for dinner, don't forget your shoes, where's your lunch, but you know, really talking about things, digging into things, reading, playing, and over a long period of time. And that's hard work. And a lot of times parents just somewhere along the way, they get tired, especially if you're a minority language parent and nobody else values it. And then you just think, well, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I trying so hard? And so, you know, there is a lot of language attrition that happens, especially in, in migrant families where the parents are, you know, of course, we're going to use our language with our children. And then they try and they try and they try. And with their first, they're quite successful. And then with their second, it's a little harder. And with their third, it's a little harder. And then those children grow up and make their own decisions. This workshop I was doing yesterday for parents, there was a grandmother there and she's Italian and she's lived in the UK for a very long time. Her children came when they were, I think, four and two. And her older son has chosen not to speak to his children in Italian. And she's heartbroken. And so she came to the seminar to find out, what can I do as the grandmother? Like, well, not much. He's made his choice. But it's not at all uncommon for bilingualism to be lost in that first generation or even, you know, sooner because, you know, because of the child's own experiences going to school. So he didn't have a very good experience when he went to school as an Italian speaker. And so he obviously maybe didn't want that for his children. And, you know, there are all kinds of things that are connected to language and emotion and identity that push us one way or another. And it is hard, in particular, in immigrant families to keep doing that hard job by yourself when society doesn't support you or your child. 
I, I did read someone actually made the comment there about certain countries, like one of the phrases someone was saying, like when you're in America, it's like you're in America, please speak English, for example. But one of the things they said is when parents are coming over with their children is through their own experience, they want their children to speak the native language of the country they're living in because they want them to assimilate as quickly and as possible. And so they will go to those depths, as it were. Um, but that's, I think, a very extreme way of going about it when they're probably moving for a better life, I guess. Whereas for yeah, well, our... Think, sorry, yeah? It's also a misinterpretation by those parents about what success means. And so if you move into a place that feels very monolingual, you will feel like your language is going to hold your child back. I heard that in the Netherlands a lot from immigrant parents. I stopped using my own language because I thought it would hold my child back. And that's a societal misunderstanding about multilingualism as a deficit. Opposite. And so those parents are making that decision because the society they move into is telling them your language is going to hinder your child here and they want the best for their children. And so they don't make that decision. And a lot of that is to do with language status. Like it's pretty rare to have somebody say, well, you shouldn't use English with your child. It's going to hold them back. Mm. You wouldn't ever, you know, I mean, nobody would say that, would they? Yeah, no. Nobody thinks English is going to hold a child back. Yeah. But you can fill in the blanks what languages people would say that about in the Netherlands. Mm. And, and it's crazy that country. this is still around because yeah. this is exactly what happened in my family with my father and his family. They came from Poland. They came to Germany. They stopped speaking Polish. Only the parents, and they said, oh, we need to be German. So yeah. they taught him a little bit in German. But then when school was introduced, they stopped speaking Polish with him. He then like some has like some background in like the like you said the basic things that he learned up until he was six and then it was a very conscious decision when he said i'm not going to speak polish with you children and also my grandma didn't speak polish with us because in her mind it was so engraved that in order to be fully assimilated into germany she has to stop everything that has anything to do with this and here i am sitting now like wish i wish i could speak polish <laughs> and yeah this is uh, but yeah it's still happening and this is now, Absolutely. 40 years, 50 years later. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying you know, I'm obviously Canadian and I would can admit that Canada is not perfect, far from it. But I think one thing that is interesting and different in Canada, and I can see the impact, is the vast majority of Canadians will identify themselves by something Canadian. I'm Italian Canadian. I'm, you know, Polish Canadian. I'm German Canadian. If you're just Canadian, people are like, what, just? You're like, I'm just Canadian. And allowing and embracing that I kind of dual identity means that people are more successful at keeping and passing on their languages and their culture. So I grew up with people who were second generation Canadians. They still spoke Ukrainian. They did Ukrainian dance. They went to the Ukrainian church on uh, uh, on the weekends. And, you know, like it's societies that don't allow for or that kind of dual affiliation, if you will, because they feel that somehow it will make you less of one to claim the other, where people really feel pushed with their parenting decisions to just be the majority. And I think that that's very particular in Europe. There is that identity as a, you know, a monolingual nation state. The Netherlands is a monolingual nation state. No, it's not. There are lots of dialects and there's Frisian. Germany is a monolingual nation state. Wait a minute. No, it's not. France is a monolingual nation state. Oh no, so not. But that, but that's what they have chosen as a marker of kind of cultural unity. And that filters down to the language decisions that people make. To be honest, it's mind blowing the fact that I think when you were talking there, some of the things that were triggering me was uh, being Irish. If I go to America, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm Irish. And you're like, no, you're not. Like, it really seeps from my like every single pore I have. It's like, you're not Irish. But they claim it because I think being in America, for example, is like you're you do come from somewhere and they are recognizing where they came from. And I think that's nice. But most people don't speak the language. They won't speak Italian or Irish or Polish or Ukrainian or whatever they might come from. So I think I what you're saying to me is now making me kind of think, are, is Europe going to be like that? Like in Amsterdam alone, like 180 nationalities, if we're all interbreeding with the Dutch people, then we're going to have 180 like different. I'm Irish Dutch. I'm German Dutch. I'm American. Dutch. Like there's going to be this whole different network. That's so mind blowing to think. And also just reconceptualize what, what does it mean to be something? So I'm Dutch because I've chosen it versus I'm Dutch because I'm born it. Whereas, Interesting. you know, kind of naturally, like you, you can't, you can't actually claim Dutchness by being born there. You have to have a Dutch parent. So huh. that's quite powerful, isn't it? Sorry, my jaw just hit the floor there when you just <laughs> said that. Okay. 
Because th- I'm just thinking like my partner is Dutch, obviously, but if other people, if they're from two very different countries, their child is born here, raised here, speaks Dutch, went to the school, did absolutely everything. They turn 18. You're saying it's still a choice. It's still a choice. So my twins were born in the Netherlands. They do not have Dutch citizenship. They could have chosen it at 18, but they would have had to forfeit their Canadian citizenship in order to do so. Or at, yeah. last, at least that's what the that's what the regulations were when when we were there. Yeah. So they're Same proud Canadians. I was, yeah. I was actually <laughs> always thinking about this, what you what you just said, this whole, and I had this discussion with my husband. We said, we wonder what our daughter identifies as, because I'm German, he's American. We moved, he, she was born here. And... I'm very curious. I'll find out probably in the next couple of years when she goes to school and what what she feels she sticks with and what what her identity is and if it's one exclusive or it's probably a melting. Pot it will of, change. Of, It'll yeah. also change over time. You know, according to who she likes and who she wants to be like and who she wants to <laughs> hang out with. You know, identity That's is true. is not yeah. fixed. But what you also said about the coming back to the the language acquisition, one thing, and when you said it's work, it is because I also now I'm hitting this point a little bit where I want to bring the depth of the German language into her vocabulary. So I really have to go in also to old books where old words are used, old syntax is used, all these like different things where we build up now the variety. How can we say something not just with one word, but with three or four different words? What's the different meaning? And I noticed it already and she's turning four now. It is work because you as a parent have to go out and I go to the library, get this specific book, go here, watch this book, they could sing this song. Like you really have to go into and yourself acquire this vocabulary where for me it's like of course I know five different ways to say I feel good or this is not I don't like this and what's the extent of my not liking it and really going into this depth of how can I give her this variety and quality of vocabulary yeah absolutely and this is the thing it's not it's not something that you're ever finished yeah So Mm -hmm. she's four now and you're already working on this, but you're going to be doing it when she's five and when she's six and when she's 10 and when she's, you know, 13 and a little more reluctant. (laughs) And so, you know, it's hard work. And so, you know, I completely understand why parents sometimes just say, you know what, enough. (laughs) And what do you think of TV shows? Is that something that is should be explored to actually then still have different people with different words and different phrases, different, yeah, context with with young children, television doesn't work for language acquisition. They might learn some kind of, you know, to mimic things by rote. But generally speaking, between birth and about four years old, we say children learn, well, we know children learn language from what we call child-directed speech, CDS. And so it's, a, it's somebody talking to them that they process. And so having a television on, they're looking at it and they're laughing along, but it doesn't mean they're processing what's being said and understanding. And so in those early years, you've got to sit with them and talk about what's happening, which I know we all want to put it on so we can make dinner. Um, no different. <laughs> as kids get older, you can use technology as a part of your family language plan. So for example, if you have you know an iPad and your child gets a certain amount of time per day or per week, well, the iPad's only in German. And so there are games you can play in German and there are you know little videos you can watch in German, but the iPad happens to be a German iPad. And so you can leverage that as kids get older and a little bit more independent to become part of your family language plan. But it's, it's not going to be as rich as, you know, conversations around the dinner table and reading good books and things like that. But it is a tool in your toolkit. And can I ask then, with regards to um, like a lost language, if we're bringing in language much later, should the other partner, like for example, if we went to the library, we got a book out in, I don't know, Swahili, for example, and this is a the language that has been lost and we're trying to now bring it back in. Should the partner who speaks Dutch or whatever other language, should they also be trying to speak it? Like if the child goes, can you read it for me? And it's like, well, this isn't my language, but I will try. Is this something that is acceptable still? Because we did speak about how it's good for the children to also understand that both parents don't speak the languages. I mean, so I mean, it depends on what languages and how you can do that. So the great thing about Kiswahili is it's written with the same alphabet and it's phonetically regular. So the non-Kiswahili speaking parent could do that with a kind of a level of success. 
<laughs> if you are not a Mandarin speaker and your child brings you a Mandarin book, well, it's not going to be that easy. But the, you know, the short answer is a big part of the success of trying to bring in a language that hasn't been part of the family language plan is the support of the parent who doesn't speak that language. Even if they don't support it by using it themselves, if they can't use it themselves, by supporting the importance of it and by being an active participant in making sure the child knows, you know, we're bringing this language back because it's a language daddy grew up with. Mommy doesn't speak it, but I also think it's really important. And so when you use a bit with daddy, you're going to help me learn a little bit too, because it has to feel like something you're doing as a family and not just as something one of my parents is doing. Otherwise, it won't seem salient to the child. They need to feel the usefulness and the relevance of the language. And so one of the best things that parents can do to support the minority language parent is to learn some of it themselves, to be open-minded, to be a risk taker, to be willing to try even if you get it wrong because you're modeling all that great language acquisition behavior to your child and you're supporting the status of that language to your child. You're showing the child that you're right, you don't hear very, very many people speak Kiswahili here in Amsterdam, but it's an important language for our family so we're all going to give it a go together. And so you shouldn't worry about your accent, you shouldn't worry about your grammar because the message you're sending about the importance of the language transcends any mispronunciation you may make. You're actually, for some reason, this is really resonating in my head with um, a video I saw recently from Brene Brown, and she was talking about there's the child focus, the parent focus, or the family focused family, as it were. And this really is resonating with the Brene Brown philosophy of it's family focused and what is the good of our family together as we are a unit. Yeah, and that's why I, I promote so strongly family language planning. It shouldn't be what one parent thinks is important and then what the other parent thinks is important and we think about their languages in isolation. It has to be what do we value as a family and how are we going to share what we value with our children? I think at the end of the day, it is down to community, as you said, and it is a case of trying to find and surround ourselves with people who have similar um, languages and cultures and whatnot. And yeah, that can be tough, but I guess hopefully through communities and events and spaces, we'll be able to start sourcing and finding people, like-minded people, like language people, like cultured people, however it might be. Okay, well, I think well. that, But I think we also have to create those people. And so, you know, one of the things I find that causes the most issues with family language plans is people being worried about using their language around other people. That fear of, well, you know, we're out in public in the Netherlands, we should only be using Dutch together, or you know, we're having a, you know, another child over for a play date who doesn't understand Russian, we shouldn't use Russian. We should never make our family language decisions based on what we think other people will think. We just need to have a conversation with the people around us. So I speak Kiswahili to my child because it's really important to me. I know you don't understand it, but I'll translate for you or you can ask my child to translate. All of that can be done and mediated without a parent feeling like my language needs to be suppressed when other people are around. That's the number one reason why languages are lost in families. Yeah, that I can definitely see here. As for me, it's like, I will always speak English here, but that's because I hear a lot of other people, but I, I do hear other people speaking Dutch when they're out and you know that that's not their first language, but it's because they feel like that's the easiest thing for them to get by. Yeah, or the, or the you know, the, the right thing to do. And I've, I've really experienced what you said, and I started doing this after we recorded the last two episodes when you said giving the child always context about why a language is used now or why it's not used right now. And I started doing this when we're in a medical setting. I usually, so my Dutch is okay-ish. So, but when it's, when I'm in a setting where I really want to make sure I understand 100%, I switch to English. And in the past, when I had done this, with some doctor and I said, yeah, yeah, my, my daughter speaks Dutch. You can speak Dutch with her. I hadn't communicated why I speak English right now. And so she refused to speak Dutch and she would just not answer and only in English. And then now when I started saying, it's okay, you can speak Dutch. I just want to make sure because my Dutch is not as good as yours. I want to make sure that I really understand everything. So I will be speaking English, but it's totally fine and great if you speak Dutch with them. And she started doing it. And I can see the immediate impact of having this conversation and she understands. And also now she helps us with the Dutch. And also one funny thing is she, you can see that she understands now or starts to understand how the language works. Because so, even if she doesn't know the Dutch word, she will use the German word and just pronounce it in a Dutch way. <laughs> yeah, I love it when you do that. This is the Dutch word. I'm like, I know that it's not the Dutch word, but good, good. We're, we're getting there. Like, we're trying. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so I can say it this immediately works when you have this conversation why and how a language used and they understand. 
Excellent. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up here because it's a lot of food for thought. And as we already said, this is actually a lot of hard work ahead of us as well as parents, multilingual parents. So back to the family language planning. Here I go. Um, thank you again, Eowyn, for joining us. And we know you've got a busy summer ahead of you with not a lot of holidays. So enjoy those days that you do have off for yourself. <laughs> and thank you again for joining us on Damn Parenting. Thanks very much for having me. Have a great day. Bye. Again, amazing reminders. <laughs> How can we bring language back? How can we introduce language? And again, context, context, and depth of language and giving the child, giving them the reason why we're speaking a certain language. As you say, I just think it, these episodes with Awen are really all about the reminder of the importance and the value, but also the recognition of the hard work that it is required to do. Yeah, yeah. And so when we're kind of feigning and going down that slippery slope, hearing this is kind kind of like it's hard for everyone just keep doing it and think about different ways like she was talking about the board games or you know hey like I'll try and learn with you you know those kind of things I think that's a really great reminder and equally it's a case of just even trying to find other people out there and like also sharing our cultures if not like yes if I meet Irish people and hang around that's great but equally if I meet other people also learning their languages and recognizing that I think is also a great example for our children as well because yeah. it's not all Dutch. Especially, I guess, also this comes in play more for you also when you are already speaking a language that within your own country is already a smaller amount of people understanding and speaking it. The Irish, not I, I'm not super firm on <laughs> Irish people, but I assume that not everyone in Ireland who's Irish can actually speak yeah. Irish. So it's something that is already within your own culture repressed and now it's like adding another layer towards you to really go for it and yeah nourish that and culture and identity also yeah and like i mean we no go pressure. back to ireland no i know but we go back to ireland because it's a thing of just kind yeah. of like yeah it's great but at the same time she's too young to understand the cultural aspect mm -hmm. and in fairness i think the food is she more doesn't or less drink the Guinness same. yet what what well <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm actually not going to go down a story because I think child custody might come into us. But no, no alcohol ever touch my child's lips. So we'll leave it at that. But um, no, I think um, language, these language episodes to me are just so super important, not just for us, but for anyone else yeah. listening. But yes, we do yeah. these episodes because we are even like, we need this reminder. We need to discuss, hey, here's another angle of language. And so, as we said at the start of the episode, myself and Myron both have actually met and spoken to other people. And there are a lot of people in our community community who actually are not speaking their native language because they don't actually use it day to day. It is Dutch, you know, it is very normalized or it might be English even. And so they kind of lose that aspect. And it was just, I just felt a shame for some of the people that I was like, oh, like, that's such a shame that you were missing that context and your child is too. And then it was also, but it's a lot of work. And it's like, yeah, but it's a lot of work for all of us. So, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. The good thing, the good thing is that this is one thing that is for free. You know, you <laughs> it, it comes for free. It's your responsibility, but it is something that is always available and we can introduce it in very different ways. Like we can start may maybe singing a song in that language, maybe look up lullaby songs or good morning songs, or if we're sitting at the dinner table, let's prepare all for like eating like a little rhyme or phrase or like make it playful and really also yourself getting in touch with the playfulness of a language and those little rhymes and the, the little things that light yourself up when using that language. I also started doing this, like really looking up some songs and especially when we go back to Germany and I meet my, what is she, my niece. So my brother's daughter and they, of course, they live in Germany, so they know all the German kindergarten songs and all that. And then when I hear them, I'm reminded of them. I'm like, oh, yes, I remember that. And then because I'm not in touch here with, with any German lullabies or any German rhyme songs. And then I remember them and I remember the feeling, the feeling when I hear them of, yes, childhood. Oh, and now and then I connect with that feeling. And then it's easier for me to pass this on because I know yeah how warm and connected this feels hearing those rhymes and those little songs and but yeah I also have to bring myself in the context to to even hear them so maybe this is 
something for you as an exercise until the next episode comes out. Dig into your home language and your your own first language. What are the nice little things, rhymes, songs, little stories, nice little um, plays with the fingers or with the toes or whatever that you have in your language where you can playfully introduce them. We'll leave it at that. And if you want to hear more from us every Monday and every Wednesday, we come out with a new episode every Monday. We drop the damn chats where even I are chatting away about a topic that has come our way the week. And, and every Wednesday, we bring out an episode with an expert on a specific topic that either even I have on our plate or the community brought to us. If you want to reach out to us with any questions, any feedback or anything that you thing that we need to hear you can catch us on instagram damn parenting podcast make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button also on spotify apple podcast youtube or wherever you get your podcasts and one thing how you can support us easy for free and it's only one click you share this episode with everyone you know with your friends and family who anyone who this information might be relevant for and bring us into the conversation if you're here and see a whatsapp message in a group a question about a topic that you know we already have over 50 episodes we have a lot of topics that are covered and a lot of questions can be answered in our episode so make sure that you spread the word support us and we will hear you on the next episode bye